Good morning, church. Good to be here with you. Uh, thanks to Pastor John jumping in last week. We got some exciting things happening at our campuses. Uh, hoping to be in our new Saratoga facility for next Sunday. That's going to take a little bit of work, a little bit of Jesus, but it could happen. Uh, we're hoping to be in there for next Sunday for the first service. And then, of course, we, uh, we're in the middle of closing on a new building for our campus in Goose Hill, north side, uh, downtown Schenectady. So God is on the move. Amen. God is doing some great things. We're excited about that. Thanks to Pastor John for, for coming last week and sharing a powerful word on forgiveness. So we're continuing our series on the parables of Jesus. The parables of Jesus. And, you know, Jesus did a lot of preaching and teaching. And it's something interesting that you see in the Gospels. When Jesus taught, people flocked to him. Large crowds would, would come whenever Jesus was sharing. Now, here's the thing. They weren't always in favor of what he had to say. They didn't always like the message, but something in their heart drew them. There, there is a search for truth, and I believe it's still uh, existing to this day. In, in the heart of man, people are hungry for the truth, even if they don't like the truth even when they reject the truth. But Jesus was preaching that truth, and it would draw crowds to him. And many times when he was preaching, we would read this phrase in the Gospels, whether it was after a parable or after a sermon. We would read the phrase, he taught as one who had authority, not as the scribes or the Pharisees. And just on a surface level, that authority, we get that. That means something to us. The, the authority of the word of God to, to get a hold of our lives. But there was even a deeper meaning in the scripture there. And I won't geek out too much with the Hebrew and stuff. But that word, authority, it meant something special. See, there was a, a set of, of texts and interpretation of scripture that was commonly accepted. And if you were a Jewish rabbi, you were obligated to not teach anything outside of that prescribed interpretation of the text. But certain rabbis had this special authority where they were permitted to not just stick to the company line, but interpret that in a unique way. And of course, when Jesus was interpreting the Old Testament scripture to people. It was in a way they had never heard before. Jesus was one of these rabbis with authority, and he told them the truth of what scripture was saying and what it really meant. And that's why the people said he teaches with authority. The authority of Christ. And you know when Jesus interpreted it, he got it right. Right? Every time. Uh, he, he always interpreted it correctly. Jesus spoke with that authority and his teachings and his words still to this day have the authority to change your life. They have the power and the authority to make lasting changes to save us, to rescue us, to deliver us from our sin. So we're going to look at another parable of Jesus this morning. The last couple of weeks we, <coughs> we talked about the soil had a couple, couple farming parables. Uh, we talked about the rich man and talked about greed and contentment. Last week, forgiveness, or probably more specifically, unforgiveness, and how that hurts us. This morning, we're in Matthew chapter 13, and we have another parable today about the kingdom of heaven, a parable that I would venture to guess is pretty misunderstood by a lot of people, but we're going to figure out what Jesus was talking about. Matthew chapter 13, verse 33, this is what he says. Another parable, Jesus spoke to them. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till it was all leavened. That's it. That is the parable. That is also the explanation, and that's all Jesus had to say about it. One verse, verse 33, the kingdom of heaven is like leaven. Leaven is yeast, makes the bread rise. Which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal or grain till it was all leavened. Jesus basically told the parable that a woman made some bread. 
I'm not sure the spiritual power here is hitting me. What is Jesus? Is this a cake? Is the, is the kingdom of God like a delicious cake that a woman, probably an Italian woman, probably a grandmother, and this delicious cake just takes over the whole earth? That is delightful. I like this parable. This is a little cream cheese frosting. Are you with me? Are you feeling it? It's not lunchtime. It is somewhere, but it's not lunchtime yet here. Jesus shares this parable about a woman baking bread. And I think the, the funny thing is, at least for us, is he doesn't explain it. He doesn't tell us what it means. Which tells me that everybody there who listened got it. And we're here like, Jesus wants us to have cake. Amen. I received that word. So what is Jesus talking about here in Matthew chapter 13? Needless to say, the wrong interpretation is Jesus wants us to make a cake, okay? But what's the right one? What's the one that the people who were there absolutely, positively got it, and they understood it, and it made sense with no further explanation needed? In the Old Testament, leaven is always, or yeast as we would call it, is always symbolic of sin. Whenever you read about leaven in scripture, the symbolism is with sin. And in Leviticus 2.11, it talks about a grain offering, and it says, no grain offering which you bring to the Lord shall be made with leaven. You've heard of unleavened bread. The Jews would eat unleavened bread. Leaven was a symbol of sin. Leaven or yeast, it, it puffs up. Pride is being puffed up. God uses leaven throughout Old and New Testament to, to signify sinfulness. So the first century Jew, they understood this probably better than you and I would. Because everything from the woman to the grain to the leaven had some significance. So what is this parable really saying? Well, it begins with a woman and it ends with sin everywhere. <laughs> Am I right, guys? Are you with me? Amen. Okay, yes, all right. No, that's not it either. It'd be nice. No, sorry. That wouldn't be nice. It'd be terrible. That's not, that's not the interpretation. But let's break it down real quick. Three parts to this parable. First, we see, and I'll give you the, the textbook Jesus definition. The woman, that phrase many times in scripture refers to Israel. Many times, Israel is symbolically represented by a woman. The woman here is not given a name or anything else, just the woman. And many times, that represents Israel. The three measures of meal or grain. Now, this is interesting. You got to know your Jewish feasts. You studied your Jewish feasts this week, right? What? You guys were not studying your Jewish Why do we do this? Uh, See, so that's why the first century Jew, they got it, because they know the feasts. It'd be like our Christmas. All right, we, we understand Christmas. One of the feasts was a grain offering. And we learn about this in Genesis in chapter 18. Chapter 18 God himself appears to Abraham and then three angelic visitors. So Sarah, being a good wife, when these visitors came, she went into the house, she took three measures of meal and baked bread and gave it to her guests. This became known as a grain offering. This, this represented fellowship with God, because that's literally what Abraham and Sarah were doing. God came and visited them, and she made a cake. That makes sense. So this grain offering became a regular thing that the Jews would do. So when they heard three measures of meal, they got it. And then Jesus told them that there was all leaven mixed in it, sin. They got that too. So what Jesus said was Israel, in their attempt to have fellowship with God, something that is so good and so pure, so much sin has gotten into it, and it has just covered through all of it, and the entire religious system is broken and full of sin. This is what Jesus was telling them. Jesus was illustrating them to them the old way is broken. The old way is in desperate need 
of some fixing because it's full of sin. Sin had crept into every part of their worship. So the parable of the leaven was really a reflection on what was happening with the Jews. And for you and I, it's a reminder of the seriousness of sin. And here, specifically, it's talking about sin getting in the way of their relationship with God. So our message this morning is really about sin. What does the Bible tell us about sin? It tells us quite a bit. I'll give you the definition of sin quickly. Technical definition, Greek word, missing the mark, missing the bullseye, not hitting dead center. Have you ever had a day where you didn't hit the bullseye every single time with everything that you did and said and thought, always perfect, right on the money? Yeah, no. Not so much. This is the definition of sin. A lot of us, we hear sin, and we think of, like, the bad things. Thou shalt not murder. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not root for the patriots. I mean, like, obvious stuff that we associate with sin. But more than that, James tells us, he that knows to do good and doesn't do it, to him it's sin. So I think that archery term, that missing the bullseye, that's sin. Sin's a problem. Sin is a problem for each and every one of us. The Bible tells us a lot about sin. We know it's a problem. Scripture says all have sinned. Who? All. all. Look to the person next to you and say, all have sinned. And if you know their business, put a little attitude behind it. Be like, <laughs> Scripture tells us. A lot of pointing. A lot of self-righteousness in the room this morning. Amen. We like to see that. <laughs> Scripture tells us that everyone has sinned. This is a problem for everybody. And I think this is important right out of the gate. We're not just talking about bad, bad, super evil people. We're not just like talking serial killers here. All. This is for you. This is for me. We've all sinned. We all, dare I say, regularly miss the mark. We miss the bullseye. All have sinned, and we fall short of God's glory. We know sin's a problem. We also know that it's serious. Scripture says what? The wages of sin are? Yeah. Death. The punishment, the payment, to reword it, the paycheck that you earn for sinfulness is death. That's what Scripture tells us. So we know it's a problem. We know it's serious because we know it cost the Son of God his life. Scripture tells us Jesus went to the cross not for himself, but because you and I owed a debt of sin that was so great we could never repay it, Jesus goes to the cross in our place and with the, the precious blood of Christ that we were just singing about this morning, with his precious blood, he pays with his own life so your sins and mine can be forgiven. So we know that sin is a problem, we know that it's serious, and we know that it costs the Son of God his life. In our study of sin this morning, we notice a couple things from this text. Right off the bat, it tells us that she, she hid the leaven. She took leaven and she hid it in the three measures of meal. It was buried in there, hidden. And it brings to mind hidden sin, secret sin. It was surrounded by a bunch of other good stuff, right? There was a lot of good ingredients going into the bread, but there was that one thing that wasn't supposed to be there, that hidden sin, that, that secret sin. To the casual observer, hardly noticeable. But over time, just as the effects of the leaven or the yeast would become apparent in the bread in the same way that hidden sin, that secret sin, over time, the effects of it will become obvious in our life. In this parable, Jesus warns us about the, the dangers of hidden sin, of secret sin. To the onlooker, to the person around, they might not even notice. 
They might not even see it. But the effects can't be hidden. Secret sin. Bunch of good ingredients. You checked all the good boxes, doing a lot of things well. But right at the bottom there, right in that secret part, that hidden part, that sin will wreak havoc in our lives. Said in first service, sin is like the junk drawer in the house. Right? You got a junk drawer? Everybody's got a junk drawer, don't they? The drawer you just throw everything in and you hope no one ever looks at it. Some of you have graduated from junk drawer to junk room. You have an, ent you have an entire room. You have company coming over to the house. Everything, everything goes in the guest bedroom or whatever. You close the door. You welcome them. And they're, oh, yeah, this is my house. This is great. But don't go in there. Okay? The, you can't go beyond that door. Hidden sin does the same thing in our walk with God. Hidden sin does the same thing. God, I give you everything. God, I give you every part of my life. Lord, take my heart, take my soul, take my voice as I sing these wonderful worship songs. But don't go behind this door. Because behind this door, I'm hanging on to something. I, I got some stuff in there that I don't want you to see. The dangers of hidden sin. When I think about sin, I think about the story of Samson. And Samson is a great story. It's the book of Judges, uh, chapters 13 through 16. Samson had issues. What do we know about Samson? Strong. <laughs> Samson was the strongest guy who ever lived. Scripture tells us this. If you read the text, you also quickly realize the dude had problems. Yeah. Samson had serious issues in his life with sin, specifically with lust, more specifically with hookers, more spe that's as specific as I get, okay? Samson had issues. He had problems. And I think it's interesting because we're told at the beginning of his life, he's the strongest man who ever lived, and the strongest man fell victim to sin and temptation. So you and I, who are not the strongest men to ever have lived, we need to watch out for sin as well. If the strongest man could fall, any of us could. Because it's more than just physical strength that's required. In the story of Samson, we see something very dangerous. Samson begins to play with sin. He begins to play with it. Like it's a game. Like it's not serious. Like it can't destroy him. Maybe you remember the story, Samson's with Delilah, one of the many unscrupulous women that he was attached to. And Delilah begins to ask him, Samson, what's the secret to your strength? You're so big, you're so strong. Oh, I love you, you're so, you're so masculine. What's the secret to your strength? Samson's response should have been, why? <laughs> why are you asking? Because she was working for the enemy. And if they could figure out the secret of his strength, they would take Samson out. And Samson had been wreaking havoc on the Philistines, killing thousands of Philistines as a judge over Israel and as their greatest warrior. Samson, what's the secret of your strength? Woman, I ain't telling you nothing. Should have got up and left. Should have never been there in the first place. But what does Samson do? He begins to play with it. Oh, well, the secret is, all right, you're not going to believe this. The secret is if you tie me up with fresh bowstrings, yeah, you know, seven of them, I'll become as weak as a little girl. He wakes up the next morning, he's tied up with seven bowstrings. Samson, the Philistines are upon you. What? <laughs> Breaks him, kills them all. At this point, Samson, a light's got to come on. Bible says he was the strongest man. Doesn't say he was the smartest. <laughs> Samson continues the game. She asks him again, oh, you made a fool of me. Oh, you silly Samson. No, really, what's the secret? Oh, well, uh, seven fresh ropes. That'll do. Oh, he gets creative at the end. If you weave my hair into the fabric of a loom, I'm like, oh, hey, points, points for creativity. I'll become weak. Three times. She does it. 
Three times the Philistines come upon him. Three times he shakes free and he kills them. Scripture says because of her constant nagging. My interpretation, that's what it says. <laughs> he eventually tells her the real thing. It's my hair. I made a vow to God, didn't shave my head. That's, that's the secret to my strength. He wakes up the next morning shaved like a cue ball. Some of you can relate. You know who you are. <laughs> Samson had lost all of his strength. The Philistines pounced on him as before, except this time he was powerless. Why? Because the strongest man who ever walked the planet played with sin. He played with temptation. He thought he could control it. See, that's the thing with hidden sin, with secret sin. We think we're in control. We think we have our handle on it. And you've heard it. Oh, I can stop anytime I want. Then why don't you? No, this doesn't have a hold on me. It's, you know, it's just there. It's, it's not a big deal. Then why don't you stop it? That secret hidden sin, he thought he could control it. One more quick story. Genesis chapter 4. Cain and Abel. Cain is angry. Cain is upset with his brother because his brother just keeps outdoing him. Sibling rivalry with literally the first siblings in the, in the world. God comes to Cain and he says something that's so powerful. Genesis chapter 4, verse 7. Cain is angry. He's got hatred in his heart towards his brother. God tells him, God now, not a prophet, not a, a man, not Adam, his father, not a donkey. God himself shows up to Cain, and he says this, Cain, if you do what is right, will you not be accepted? Cain, do the right thing. But listen to this. But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door, and it desires to have you. But you must rule over it. You must conquer it. You must Master it. Sin is at your door. And it desires to have you. But you must master it. Sin is at the door. But you know what Jesus said? Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if anyone opens the door, I will come in. Sin is at your door and it desires to have you, but Jesus is also at your door knocking. Yeah. Woo. And whoever you open the door to is going to dictate what happens with your life. Sin is crouching at your door. You've probably heard the old quote, sin will take you farther than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you want to pay. This is the truth of sin in our lives. This is the truth of hidden sin, of the sin that we play with, the sin that desires to overcome us. Like that list of ingredients. So many good things. But then, just a little sin, a little, a little leaven gets into the mix. And we like to look at the good things. We like to look at maybe how far we've come, amen? How many of you are thankful for how far God has brought you? Amen. The Bible says, he who has been forgiven much loves much. I've been forgiven a lot. I've been forgiven a lot. God has done amazing things in my life, in my family, in my mind, from my past to my present and in my future. I trust him with it. He who's been forgiven much loves much. The list of ingredients, oh God, look at all the good things you've done. Look at how far we've come. Look at all the obstacles we've, we've hurdled. But as you go down the list, in those secret parts, in those hidden places, those places you don't want anyone to have access to, deep in the parts of your soul where you're holding on, to some things from that sinful life. And remember, the Bible tells us, all have sinned. All have sinned. This isn't 
just for the person next to you. This is for you. I mean, in fact, that's easy. I mean, to do a deep evaluation of someone else, not only is that easy, sometimes that's enjoyable. I could find fault with you. It's a gift. <laughs> but when we have to turn the mirror inward, shine the light of God's word inward, we need to look at ourselves, and we're reminded that all have sinned. We're reminded, Jesus says, we have to put to death that sinful nature every single day. When we begin to take inventory, we see that there's some dark corners. There are some dark spots. There are some areas where we've allowed sin to stay put, where we haven't thrown it out, where we haven't conquered it. Maybe it's something as simple as pride. We talked about yeast and puffing up. Pride's the original sin. It's pride that got Satan, Lucifer, thrown out of heaven. Sin of pride pops up in our life. We talked a couple weeks ago about greed. Maybe there's an area of greed in our heart. Maybe it's an area of, of lust. That doesn't hurt anyone. It's not affecting anybody. Nobody needs to know about it. It's just, it's nothing. Ignore it. But like that little bit of leaven, in time, it bears fruit. In time, it hurts you. In time, sin will separate you from God if you allow it to go unchecked in your life. Maybe it's a little bit of the unforgiveness we talked about last week. Oh, but I'm forgiving most people. Like most of the stuff we've forgiven. But there's some things, you know, that one guy, him, you know him, right? You got that one guy in your life, that one person. Even God can't forgive him. Right? You hold on to that one. That little bit of unforgiveness that still takes root in our heart. Doesn't matter what the sin is. Could be anything. Could be something as simple as anxiety. Fear, worry, worry is a sin. What? Worry is a sin. When you worry, you tell an all-powerful God, I am not confident in the way you are doing this. Worry is a, a direct assault on God's sovereignty. When you worry, you question if God's in control. Worry, fear, anxiety, sin. These little areas in our life. And we're so proud, in a good way, of the steps that we've taken. That we're not who we used to be. That God has brought us further and we're doing well. But there's still these areas. And for some, those, those secret, hidden, little areas are just allowed to continue. And it's wearing away at your soul. And it's hurting you. And here's the point of the parable. The point of the parable wasn't judgment. The point of the parable wasn't you terrible, hopeless people. The point of it is a loving, heavenly father wants more for you. Yes. That's what we need to get. The reason we talk about hidden sin isn't so you could walk out on a 90 degree afternoon and feel worse. It's because we have a Father in heaven who loves us, loves us so much. He sent his Son in our place so that you and I could be free, so that we can be everything that God desires for us to be. So if there are some things we need to get rid of, if there are some things we need to take care of, if the Holy Spirit, even in this moment, is beginning to just pinprick in your heart, it's not because God's mad at you. But because he loves us. Right. Word of God says it's his kindness that leads to repentance. The love of God because God has more for you. Because God isn't finished with you. So we need to deal with our stuff. Even the little stuff. Even the secret stuff. Even the stuff nobody else knows about. To deal with that little bit of sin before it affects everything. That's the sin in our life. In the book of Psalms, David takes inventory of his own life. Yes, it's fun taking inventory of others. David does his own life. And David has learned a few things at this point. Because David learned a lot of lessons the hard way. 
If you read through the life of King David, and Scripture calls him a man after God's own heart, he makes mistakes. He, he messed some things up big time. But he always managed to come back to God. And in his later years, we read this. David just getting an understanding of the situation that he's put himself in. Psalm 38, 3 through 5. This is what he writes. There's no soundness in my flesh because of your anger, nor any health in my bones because of my sin. David understood that sin was serious and sin displeased God. He understood that sin in his life created a barrier between him and God. He goes on, he says, For my iniquities have gone over my head like a heavy burden. They are too much for me. Not just in the kiddie pool of sin. Maybe not just wading off the shore and it comes up to the waist. Not just up to here. Italians, you've heard that one. Hey, enjoy it here, buddy. His sin is over his head. He's drowning in the iniquity of his sin, of his choices. God, it's too much for me. It's a burden too heavy for me to carry. Verse 5, he says, my wounds are foul and festering. I'm not going to elaborate on that. Because of my foolishness. A young David ran headfirst into terrible situations, but an older David understood that it was his foolishness that would get him in over his head, and it would anger God, and it would hurt his relationship with God. So David, who had a heart after God, always sought to make it right. David understood the seriousness of his sin. And the problem all too often is we underestimate the sin in our own life. David understood the ramifications for sin. He understood the, the fruit that it would bear not only spiritually, but physically, in his relationships. David's sin cost him dearly, and he understood this. Parents, you get this. Parents, you see your kids making bad choices. And it's not that you're angry just because they disobeyed you, but that's part of it. Okay, but that's not it. It's because you know what happens with these bad choices. You know what it leads to. And God, in the same way, warns us, this parable, warning us about our secret, hidden, nobody knows about sin because he sees what it brings, because he loves you so much and it breaks the heart of, of your heavenly father who sent his son to purchase us with his blood to see us stuck and struggling and the effects of that sin to continue in our life until it ruins everything. God tells us because he loves us. God tells us and he warns us because he wants the very best for us. King David understood how serious his sin was. We forget that. We forget it. We think, oh, it's no big deal. Oh, it's not going to hurt anyone. Oh, it's just a little white lie. What does that even mean? That's racist. You can't say that. <laughs> we think our sin's not serious. But it is. It's serious to God. David grew to understand that. We need to learn that as well. That our sin matters. And dealing with it is important for our life and for our family and for our future. And most of all, for our relationship with God. Addressing the areas, not in everyone else's life, in our own life. Dealing with ourself. Addressing what needs to be addressed. Your life is the sum of your decisions. And that's a really unpopular statement today. We live in a victim-driven society. Everyone has an excuse about why it's somebody else's fault. Everybody. Somebody else did it to me. It's a condition. Uh, I was born that way. It's, they hurt me. My father was abusive. Whatever. I'm the way I am because of other people. But I want you to know today, you're the way you are because of you. Yeah, right. That's hard. 
People don't want to hear that today. But we all make decisions. And our choices have consequences. Your life is the sum of the decisions that you have made. Now, let me be very clear. I understand that most likely you've had things in your life that have happened to you that you had nothing to do with. Everyone has. Please understand this. You are not unique. In this world, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. Jesus has overcome this world. Everyone, if you live long enough, everyone loses somebody that they love. If you spend any time on this earth, you know someone who you love who's battled illness. You know somebody who's endured tragedy. Your story may be different. Your details might be unique. But we've all experienced bad stuff because this world is full of them. Side note, heaven isn't. And I can't wait to be there. But in this world, there's a lot of hard stuff. I I get it. I know. And you know. You live with it and you deal with it. We're not always in control of what happens to us and around us. But we're always in control of how we respond to it. And that's why your life and my life is the sum of the decisions that we've made when we've chosen to blame God instead of running to God, when we've chosen to ignore God instead of pursuing God, when we've chosen to do it our own way, to numb, to distract the pain instead of bringing it to the altar. Our choices our life, the sum of our decisions. And when you make the decision to leave a little bit of that leaven, it can ruin the whole thing. A little sin goes a long way. It goes a long way. So what do we do? Let's get to the good stuff here. What do we do? Hebrews 12 tells us what to do. It says, lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily besets us and run the race. Lay the sin down and get running. Some of y'all have been standing on the side of the road with your sack of sin. Put it down and start running the race. How do we do that? I want you to know this morning, and this is important, Jesus wants to heal you. Jesus wants to set you free, and you are not stuck where you are right now. Understand that this morning. We got to get this in our head. Jesus has the power to heal you, and he wants to heal you of your sin. He wants to break the chains of bondage to free you, to be the man of God, the woman of God that he's called you to be. You are not stuck. You have not out the grace of God. You are not so bad. Oh, pastor, you don't know what I've done. I don't, but Jesus did. And he went to the cross, and he took the nails in his hands. He's got you covered. He's got me covered. So you're, you're not disqualified. No one listening to this this morning. Nobody catching this online later. None of you slackers in the foyer who should be in church, but you're out there. You, I'm talking to you. Yeah. We have not out the grace of God. He's here for us. He's not finished with us. So glad, so glad that God's not finished with us. Three things. Three things we need to do, then I'll call up the worship team. Number one, you need to recognize your position in Christ. See, Scripture says you were a sinner, but now you're a saint. Scripture says repeatedly, you've been made new. Scripture says you've been born again. It says you are a new creation. You are not, believer, I'm talking to you right now. You are not who you used to be because of the power of God. You are a new creation. Ephesians 2.10 says it so wonderfully. Ephesians 2.10 says, for we are God's masterpiece. His masterpiece. Pastor John last week was talking about art a little bit. 
going through a museum and looking at these wonderful paintings. And some, maybe, maybe you see a Picasso in there, maybe a Rembrandt or some incredible work of art, and you walk up to it and you're like, nah, it doesn't really do it for me. <laughs> I mean, like, it's okay. I wouldn't want it in my living room. See, what makes a masterpiece isn't your opinion of it. What makes a masterpiece is who made it. God says you are his masterpiece. Doesn't matter how you feel about that. You are his masterpiece. He's put his name on you. He created you in his own image. Believer, understand, you're not stuck where you are. You are a child of God. And he will break every chain. And the power of sin was defeated at the cross. The power of sin has already been defeated. Grab on. Lay hold. Run your race. Recognize your position in Christ. Second thing you need to do, ask God to search you. This was David again. Psalm 139, 23 and 24. It says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties. See if there is any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. David understands conquering sin begins with an honest talk with God. Because David had seen what happens when sin went unchecked in his life. David saw what happened in his family when he allowed sin to go unchecked. David saw what happened in his own life when he allowed sin to go unchecked. And now an older, wiser David cries out, God, search me and know my heart. And even if there's something I can't put my finger on, you point it out to me. Holy Spirit, you convict me. If there's even a root, if there's even a bud, a sprout, the beginning of an unclean thought, a lustful thought, a prideful thought, an angry thought, God, whatever, nip it in the bud. Search me, oh God. And know my heart. Sometimes you don't need to do a lot of searching. It's pretty obvious. Other times, God, is my heart right in this? God, are my motives what you want them to be? Lord, am I honoring you in this? Search me, oh God. Know my heart. David invited the Holy Spirit in. And this is what the Holy Spirit does. Scripture tells us the Holy Spirit comes to convict the world of sin righteousness and judgment, the Holy Spirit of God convicting you right now, letting you know, hey, this is for you. God has more for you. God's not finished with you. David invites God in to search his heart. And as the team comes, the final step simply is this, the power of repentance. The power of repentance. And somewhere along the line, churches have taught that repentance is like an apology, and it's not. Repentance means so much more than this. John the Baptist preached this, if you remember. Repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus came preaching the same thing, calling people to repentance. What does that mean? What does it mean to repent? The actual definition of the word, more than an apology, is changing your mind about sin. It changes the way you feel about sin. True repentance. Samson lived his whole life playing with sin, but in the very end, we see the signs of a repentant heart because he realized all that he had done, and he cried out to God in his imprisonment, in his captivity. David understood the seriousness of sin. He understood that what he had taken for granted previously, the things that he had done and not even thought through, he had changed his mind about those things, and he doesn't want to partake of them anymore. Repentance is so much more than, God, I'm sorry. Repentance is changing the way you think about sinfulness. And that's my prayer this morning as we, as we look at this parable and we go through this. I want you to change the way you think about sin in our lives. Because again, all, all have sinned. All have fallen short of the glory of God. Doesn't mean like, oh, okay, well, we've sinned. What are you going to do? It's about dealing with it. 
It's about understanding the seriousness of it. It's about understanding that it hurts us and it hurts those we love and it hurts our relationship with God. And if we let it go unchecked, it can ruin the whole thing. This is the message of a loving Heavenly Father. Repentance. <coughs> Changing our mind about sin. Changing the way we think about it. And along with repentance, we have confession. 1 John 1.9 tells us, if we confess our sins to him, Jesus is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from, from what? From all, from all unrighteousness, from all wickedness. If we confess our sins to God, he's faithful. Sinner, I have good news for you. He's faithful. If we confess our sins, not hide our sins, not play with our sins, not think that we're controlling them, when they're controlling us, but when we confess them to our Heavenly Father, and that's it. You don't have to go into a booth and confess it to me. I don't want to know. <laughs> you don't need some person to be a go-between between, between you and your Heavenly Father. You go directly to the throne of grace, and you can obtain mercy and grace to help in time of need. You go right to Him directly, and we go through the blood of Jesus. We go through the cross of Christ that we can go before the throne of God and we confess our sins and he washes us and he cleanses us. You've been holding on to this attitude. You've been holding on to a bad habit. You've been holding on to this hidden sin for so long. It's become a part of you. But I want you to know today when you confess it before almighty God, he makes you as white as snow. Cleanses us from all all, not some, all wickedness. We confess our sin to God. We can't win this battle alone. If we're going to win the battle over sin, we need to put our trust completely in Jesus. Completely in Jesus for our salvation. Believer, you have victory over sin because of what Jesus did for us. We are no longer slaves. Scripture says, he who the Son sets free is free indeed. You are free from your sin this morning if you're a follower of Christ. You can still choose to, but you're free from it. Sin has no power over you. The power of sin was broken at the cross. The Son has set you free. Walk in that freedom. Walk in that freedom that God has purchased for us by his amazing grace. And I close it with Jeremiah 17, 14. Simply says this, heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. Save me, O Lord, and I shall be saved, for you are my praise. You might feel like it's hopeless. You might feel like it's too far gone. You might feel like it's too, too deeply rooted. I want you to know this morning, call on his name. Jesus, save me and I will be saved. Heal me, heal my sin and I will be healed. Call upon the name of God this morning. Confess your sins to God this morning. Invite God to search every part of your heart and your mind and your life and do what he's calling you to do. Would you bow your heads with me this morning? I want to pray over you in just a moment. If you're here this morning, this message was just for you. It was, it was just for you. That when God spoke these words 2,000 years ago, it was just for you and I. So we would look at it, so we would get it, so that we would understand the seriousness of sin, understand the price that Jesus paid, and understand the love of a heavenly father who doesn't want us to be stuck there anymore. God loves us. If you're here this morning and you haven't put your faith in Jesus for your salvation, 
you have a problem. You have a sin problem. And there's nothing you can do to fix your sin problem. Romans tells us that the law was written to point out how sinful we were. All the rules and the thou shalt nots were just pointing out that we can't do it, that we're not good enough. We need Jesus. We need a Savior. We need to put our trust and our faith in him. If you're here this morning and your relationship with God is not where it needs to be, I want you to know those nail-scarred hands are open wide and he's inviting you back. He's inviting you in to put your trust, to put your hope in him. And if you're here today and you're a believer, you've been set free. You don't have to carry this anymore. You don't have to deal with the circumstances and the, the, the ramifications of the sin. You've been set free. You can overcome by the blood of the Lamb. You're not stuck. Give it to Jesus. Give every part, every area to Jesus. And let's become the men of God, the woman of God that he's called us to be. Would you stand together with me this morning? bow your heads as you do. Let's pray together. And then as we sing this last song, these altars will be open if you want to come, if you want to pray. Doesn't mean you're the worst sinner in the room. That person was here first service. You're good. But just to connect with God. Maybe you need to confess something to God. Maybe you want someone to pray. Whatever you need. But let's just spend these last few moments seeking the Lord together. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. God, I thank you that you love us so much that you warn us you don't just warn us of the danger of sin, but God, then you provide the way for us to overcome it. You provide for us the victory, the freedom, the chains are broken, that sin no longer has its hold on us because of the cross. Lord, thank you that you purchased us with the precious blood, your precious blood, that we can be free, that we can deal with our sin problem, that we can have eternal fellowship with our heavenly Father, and God, that we can be the men and women of God that you've called us to be. Lord, thank you for your word today. Speak to our hearts. Lord, make changes. Make eternal changes in our hearts and our lives this morning. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Let's worship him as we close. Thank you, Jesus, for the blood cloud. Thank you, Jesus. It has washed me white. Thank you, Jesus. You have saved my life. Brought me from the darkness into glorious light. Oh, thank you, Jesus, for the blood. has washed me white. Thank you, Jesus, you have saved my life. Brought me from the darkness into glorious life. I was a wretch, I remember who lost, I was blind, I was running out of time. Sin separated, the breach was far too wide. But from the far side of the chasm, you held me in your side. So you made a way across the great divide. Left behind heaven's throne to build it here inside. And there at the cross, you paid the debt I owe. Broke my chains, freed my soul, and for the first time I am whole. Thank you, Jesus, for the blood.
Jesus. Thank you this morning, church. Thank you, God, for taking me, transforming me, and setting me anew. Father, I thank you for the truth of your word that came forth this morning. God, I pray that in instances where we felt comfortable before, that we would begin to feel uncomfortable. Father, that you would reveal sin in our lives that needs to be transformed by the power of your blood. Jesus, we come to you knowing that without you, we can't go through this life peacefully. Without you, there is death at the end of this. And we know that you are the author of life. We know that you can save and you will heal and you will transform the deepest, darkest parts of us. We praise you for that transformation that we can live and go forth in, in your name. We praise your mighty name. Thank you, Jesus, for your blood. Amen. Be blessed, church. We'll see you next week.